The path to retirement is a long one. And while in the Instagram generation, it appears to be a fairly straightforward and simple process, those that have retired will tell you that it's been a long road. And it's unfortunate because I know there are individuals that look at my channel or some of the other channels on the YouTube and say, you know, I want to retire next year. I want to retire in five years. And in a lot of cases, it just takes a little bit longer uh, than that. <clears throat> but that's not to say that there aren't things that you could specifically do to get yourself uh, in the right framework to to be able to really move down that path. And so today, what I'd like to talk a little bit about are nine of the steps that will move you towards creating that framework towards being in a position to to start thinking about and moving towards retirement. Um, and and this is really a, a holistic approach. It takes into account not just the practical financial strategies, but there's a whole host of emotional and psychological strategies and aspects that impact a, a person's ability and, and where they are in the journey. So, but before we get into that, I would just like to ask that you uh, take a moment Subscribe to the channel. Um, if you like the content, uh, hit that like button just so we can make sure that this information gets out to, to more people. So with that being said, let's get into it. So again, these are these are the nine steps that I took and that that really helped set the framework for me over a period of, of, of many years. Uh, many of these will help you in, in other in other parts of your life. So uh, number one, facing your fears. Um, one of the fears that I had early on was that I didn't feel like I had enough money to save, um, much less save for retirement. I was afraid that if I put money into the bank or I started to put money into retirement accounts that I was going to be broke. And, you know, I know a lot of us feel like, you know, the future is not guaranteed and, and that, you know, you're wasting your time. What if I, I go through all these steps and things don't happen, which are all valid, but, you know, I had to confront the reality that what would I do if I were wrong in any of those assertions? And so I think the first step is really to to face those fears and, and try to understand, you know, what are some of those barriers? Because that gives you some place to work from or a starting point. Uh, number two, I want to take a moment to understand my spending habits and, you know, how do I save and, and how do I think about money? I, I think I've mentioned before that I come from a place where people didn't have a bunch of money and I never thought I had enough to save. So, so I was spending everything that I had. If I had it, I spent it. Um, and instead of looking at the big picture, I looked a lot at, you know, what's the amount of the monthly payment? Oh, I could pay $50 a month. Oh, I could pay $10 a month. And, you know, it gets to a point where it starts to $10 you out and you just don't have any money, but the amounts are small, but they add up over time. Um, and, and the only time I really did save was for a big purchase. And that might have been something weeks away. You know, my saving was, okay, this check, I got this. And my next check, I'm going to get that as opposed to looking at the big picture. And unfortunately, a lot of when I looked around, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me that had any money or that were saving and everybody was doing the same thing that I was. Um, and I and I hate to use cliches, as, as you know, but, you know, people were living paycheck to paycheck. And and so I didn't think it was for me to have that money. And if I had that, I was somehow doing something wrong. It's almost like that guilt that you feel. So I you know, and, and, and so I had to really change my mindset to understand that I had what I deserved and trying to obtain more was not greedy or selfish. I was under the impression that it was that it was greedy and, and selfish of me to have more than maybe others did. And so that moved me towards the path of number three, uh, reevaluating uh, my beliefs and attitudes and, and really do the work to adapt some new perspectives. Um, I had to really think about the fact that I worked hard to succeed. I went to college. I had a job and, and, and worked my way through an occupation, into an occupation, at least at that time, uh, to where I deserved what I had, as opposed to feeling guilty for what I had accomplished. Uh, I, I started to realize that living within my means was possible. You know, a lot of times we, we look at what we make and we look at what we spend and is it is it painful? Yes. Um, I, I hate to use the, the analogy that seems so 
popular now, but if you stop spending $5 a day on coffee, then you have a million dollars by the time you're 50. That may be true. I just don't think that's a very influential argument because the fact of the matter is, is most people aren't struggling financially because they're out buying coffee. It's because they go out and buy new furniture because they buy the latest car. They, they do those types of things. And so living within my means, once I realized that that was possible and took those steps to uh, live within my means, things started to drastically change because then the money that I was saving, I wasn't getting hit with. Uh, down the road with with some other bill or some other cost. Um, and I started to identify uh, with people that fit where I was going as opposed to where I am. Unfortunately, we live in, I, you, you've heard me speak about it before, but we live in what, are, what I like to call loops. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are caught in the same loop and they'll never change that loop. And, and it's unfortunate for them. And it's unfortunate for us if we're trying to do something different. And the challenge is, is our reality a lot of time is based on what we see and, and what we experience with or through others. And so if we're around people that are in the loop, that are constantly putting you in situations to get that next payment, to live outside of your means, to buy the nicest car, to keep up with the Joneses, then you're always going to be in the same situation. So I started to identify with people that I wanted to be or where I was going. Uh, as opposed to people that, that kept me in that same loop. Um, number four, uh, be honest about your financial situation. You know, it, I was there was a point where I, I said, look, I'm, I'm not getting to where I want to go. So I just need to sit down and, and take a look at my financial situation and, and try to understand how broke am I? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a tough realization. Again, nobody said this was going to be easy. There's, there's some work here. But when you come out on the other side, it's so rewarding because you start to understand the world in a completely different way, whether it's money, whether it's life, whatever it is. So I wrote down all my debts, uh, my total debts and you know, in total and my monthly payments. And so everything I was paying, all those $10, those $5, those $50, the three, $400 car payments and everything. I wrote down what I spent on groceries. Um, every grocery trip is a little bit different. But if I took that aggregate, then at least I could get an average and say, okay, over the course of the year, here's what I'm spending on groceries and start to really understand what, um, what I was, what I was spending on and, and, and where those tendencies were and where I was wasting money. You know, on a side note, I, um, in 20, 2021, I went to the doctor, the doctor told me I need to lose a little bit of weight. So I went to the, I started to uh, use an app that forced me to, to log what I was eating. And what I found was just by keeping that accountability, having that accountability mirror in front of me, watching what I was eating and being cognizant of it and not making any big changes, but just being smarter about it, I found that I lost 27 pounds in a period of about two years. Now, the as it relates to this, as I started to look at my groceries, I started to realize how much of the stuff I was buying that I really didn't need or that I maybe needed once a month, but didn't need every time I went on a, on a grocery trip. So being honest about your financial situation works. Also looking at my, my cell phones, and yes, I come from a time when there were landlines in the house, and my internet, um, and, and my cable costs. Just to see where I am. I know now there's apps out there that help you get rid of subscriptions and things like that. And on an ongoing basis, about once every quarter, I take a look and see what I'm spending. I take a look and see how much internet usage I'm using. I take a look at my cell phone plan and try to understand do we need the plan that we're in? Is there a less expensive option? Is there a way for us to, to trim that a little bit? Because instead of spending that $10, that $20, or those $50 a month, what if you could take those off? Because then what you're in effect doing is paying yourself. And then I did the really difficult thing, which was I compared my paycheck stub to all of my debts and expenses. And I had to look at myself and say, Am I doing myself any justice as it as it relates to this? And you know, I convinced myself that as long as I could make the monthly payment, I was fine. But I wasn't paying attention to the juggling act I was going through every month just to survive. What if the PG and E or our, our energy bill is higher than what it was supposed to be? What if there's an increase to your internet? What if I, I don't know about you, but it seems like my my internet and my cell phone bills are different every single month. And I know it's taxes and the CPUC and all these different things, but one small change would have put me into disarray. So every month 
I was in a little bit of disarray because I was trying to figure out each of those, uh, you know, how I was going to juggle each of those. And, and that, and when it hit me, I realized I shouldn't be juggling. I should be in control of it. And so what I started to do after that was I started to fill the holes by planning for long-term financial uh, well-being, you know, the just in case uh, scenario. And it was, it was difficult. I, I had to set boundaries. There was, there was money being spent that I wasn't aware of. There was money being spent that was going to stuff that was unnecessary. Um, and I had to set boundaries I, in terms of lending people money or giving people money or um, just all of these ways that money, as, as we called it in business, we called it revenue leakage, all of that revenue leak, leakage. Uh, then I went on to set up a trust, uh, just the way so if something were to happen to me, my debts and my expenses and all that don't get pushed on to the next person and people don't get caught up in probate and things like that if with houses and cars and, and, and all of those types of uh, assets that, that tend to create problems uh, when people pass away. I didn't want anybody that was after me to be stuck with those. Uh, created college funds for, uh, uh, for my kids. Um, I wanted to make sure that there was money that if it came to the point where they were going to college, that I was going to have money put away and I wasn't going to get hit with a huge tax bill uh, be, for taking it out. So I started 529 plans for both of them. And just as a way to ensure that down the road, how do I not get hit with huge tax bills and huge costs and things like that? Because if I was making a commitment to myself to do this work, I wanted to make sure that the work was, as they say these days, sustainable. Um, and so, and, and lastly, uh, one of the holes was filled was just life insurance policies. Again, this goes back to making sure that people don't get caught with a bunch of unexpected costs or, you know, cost of funerals. That costs money. Um, my father passed away a few years ago and it cost some money to, to go through that process. So I didn't want people to get caught with that. Um, number six, I made a conscious decision to make better decisions. You know, we all talk about making better decisions and, and we all say what we're going to do. Yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. But I actually made a conscious decision to make better decisions. I wanted to make wise financial decisions. And so the question that I asked myself, is this a wise decision? If the answer is no, then I rethink that decision. Does that mean that I'm perfect? No. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes improvement because perfection does not exist. Uh, I started looking at big purchases to determine if they were needs or if they were, uh, uh, or, or if I just wanted it, if they were an impulse buy. You'd be surprised that, you know, it's funny because the biggest impulse buy that most people have is their house. People go into a house, they like it, they like the colors, they like the lights, they like how it's laid out, and they go and they put an offer in on it in the next day or so, and this is the largest asset that most people have. Um, but your cars, everything else are those things that you need or are those things that you want. And if you, I, it's my belief that if a person is making a big purchase, they should be able to afford it. Don't buy a house if you can't afford to make the payments or you can't afford everything else because then your house poor. It's life is about living. These are all things that are designed to help you live a more fulfilled life, not to create additional stress. Um, you know, purchase assets instead of things. One of the things, and this is a fairly recent uh, realization, is there's a difference between assets and things. Assets grow value. Assets you can actually sell for a significant amount of, of money. You could sell um, a house. You could sell a, uh, let's say, an RV or, or, or art. A lot of people are, are buying art. There are things that you buy that actually can increase in value over time. And then there's things, there's knickknacks. Um, when I went to Galveston just a couple of weeks ago, or just this past week, we went into a gift shop and I saw a gift shop and it had cool stuff, stuff that I'm sure people would like, but it was all crap. And so I had to ask myself, what have I done with all of the crap that I got from all the vacations that I've taken? I haven't done anything with them. I might have a t-shirt somewhere. I do have this one straw hat that I bought in Hawaii um, about eight years ago. And it was just because with the bald head, 
I needed something to cover my head and I got the hat and I still have it. Um, the, you know, it's, and if there's things that there were things that, that had dollar value, but didn't have personal value. Um, there's things that I, that I have that sure, they may be worth a couple of dollars, but I didn't really, I never used them. I, and I asked myself the question I asked myself is, have I used or thought about this thing in the past year? And the answer is no. And I know sometimes we get caught in a, well, what if we do need it? Then buy it again. But most of the time, you're not even going to think about it. Once it's gone, it's gone. But I spent so much on this. Well, but once you spent that money, it's gone. Sell the things that have no dollar value or that have dollar value, and it, uh, but, no, but don't have personal value. If they don't have personal value, then you're not thinking about them. And at some point, you got to be honest with yourself in this process so you can start to move yourself into the place that you, that you want to be. Um, I put myself and my relationship with my wife above all other relationships. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that involve themselves in your life. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Family is important. And I'm not saying family is not important. Your friends are important. But at the end of the day, and, and I realized this when um, my father passed away, there were a lot of people that liked my dad. He was a cool cat. You know, people liked him. The, the problem was when he was, when it was that moment, his, his last few days, I looked around the room at the people that were there and the people that traveled in to say, hey, goodbye, you are important enough for me to take time out of my day to be here with you. And it wasn't that many people. And then it hit me that folk, we don't, we spend a lot of time trying to cultivate the relationships of people that we may see somewhere down the road or we may never see again. And sometimes we can take for granted the relationships that are the most important to us. So I, I decided to put myself, my relationship with my wife above all of the rest of the relationships. And interestingly enough, that really helped me financially because then I wasn't out running the streets and partying and stuff because it wasn't about all of that because what I needed was right here at home. And I also think that it's, it's very important to value your personal relationships on a regular basis. Um, you know, there's friends that got you to this point, but then there's friends that are going to take you forward. And I think it's incredibly important to evaluate your relationships because as you start to move out of that loop, then the way that people see you is going to be different. And that, uh, folks, that's a painful revelation. I have people that I've known for 20 years that I've had to break with because as I started moving down the path, because they weren't moving down the same path, they started to engage in these what I call microaggressions and and in some cases, they became haters. And in some places, cases, we just didn't relate to each other anymore. And so it becomes a, a burden or a drag to hold on to relationships with people that aren't on your same vibration. And I mean, there's a bunch of different types of friends. And I think when you retire, your friend groups change. And I'm going to do a video on that uh, in the next couple of days. So stay tuned. But I, but evaluate your personal relationships. If they're not filling your cup, then you're taking your juice and you don't want anything to take the juice. You want things that fill your cup because again, you deserve that. Uh, number seven, I started to trust my judgment when I was making my financial decisions. I, I, I always, I, I've always had this problem and we all have problems and I got 99 problems and, um, one of my problems is that I always underestimate what I think I know. And I've always underestimated the, um, the value of my intuition. And it's funny, there's, a, there's an individual named Jim Collins that wrote the book, Good to Great. Many of us have probably heard of that. There was a Forbes article, I think it was Forbes. Um, if it's not, please let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll try to get a, a correction out on that. But I believe it was a Forbes article back somewhere in the 90s. And he said, or in the 2000s, I'm sorry, and he said, early 2000s, he said something to the effect of trust your gut. Because your gut, he says, trust your gut because your gut feeling comes from the sum total of all of the experiences that you've had in your life. And when he said that, it struck a chord because I always saw myself as I'm just, what's the 80s song? I'm just an average man with an average life. I work from nine to five. Hey, hell, I pay the price. But 
that doesn't take away from the fact that we've all had a host of experiences that brought us to this place. And so I started to trust myself. And as I started to trust myself, I started to know I need to ask another question here or this doesn't sound right. And I, 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 I eventually was able to stop asking advice of other people and, and relying on what other people thought. One of the challenges that I think we have as, a, as people sometimes is we get concerned, and I know we don't think we do, and we all say we don't, and I'm going to dispel that now because, you know, the, the reality is, is the reason that a lot of people do a lot of things is because of the impact on other people. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes when you focus on the, the advice of others, you get tied into what others are thinking, and then... It, it throws you off. And the worst thing to happen is when you say, damn it, I knew it. I knew it. Because not only are you mad that you didn't do something, you're mad that you didn't trust yourself. Uh, when it comes to your finances, stay engaged in the process. There was a period of time where I trusted other people to make good decisions with my money. And I ended up broke because what you what I found was other folks were doing what was good for them, what was filling their cup, what was helping them feel okay. Get, and I had just a little bit over here to keep me pacified, but I was broke. And so I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to stay engaged in the process. Um, and even when I deal with my financial advisor, I trust but verify. My financial advisor gives me some really great information. I, I will tell you that he provided me access or us, I guess, access to information, financial information that we would have otherwise not known. But then I took the opportunity to educate myself on those things. So I knew what he was talking about. And so even a trusted professional, I'm not going to say, and I'm not the guy to go and second guess everything everybody tells me. Because I, I think there's people that are contrarian and it, it gets old after a while. People make bad decisions and so on. But if, But at least take the time to understand what your financial advisor, your financial person, or whoever, whatever the professionals, take the time to understand what it is that they're telling you. So at least it makes sense. You may not understand it all conceptually, but it should all make sense logically. And if it doesn't make sense logically, that means there's another question to be asked. And don't be afraid to ask anybody any questions because most of the time, the people that are important enough for you to ask questions to are people that you're paying and you want to make sure exactly what you're paying for. Uh, number eight, uh, be open to opportunities to move forward. There was a time when people stayed at jobs and 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 did things and sacrificed because it was good for uh, it, it was good for the family and it was it was it was good for your career and it was overall the the right thing to do. Uh, but we're not in 1950 anymore. Things have changed, uh, and we have to be able to to make and changes that benefit us and our families because. If you don't make decisions that are best for you and your family, nobody else will. As much as organizations care about people, you are an employee. They are paying you for your time. And if they weren't making money because of your efforts, then you would not be there. If you leave, you're going to be okay. And it's, it's funny because one of a friend of mine that also has a YouTube channel, uh, a guy named uh, Joe Kuhn, one of the things he says is the company was fine 30 years before you got there. The company's going to be fine uh, after you're gone. And so don't stifle yourself into feeling like you're so important that you're going to stay in a job and you're not going to do something that benefits your family. Because at the end of the day, when my father passed away, nobody from the company, uh, no representative from the company was in that hospital room. Some of them came to the funeral because, you know, people want to be all up in your business, but they weren't in the hospital room, um, you know, just spending the time. So, and again, shout out to Joe Kuhn at Joe Kuhn Loves Retirement. Check out his page. It's incredible. Um, so anyway, let's keep going. Uh, understand uh, that you also, and this is just based on my professional expertise, I can state this factually. Generally, generally, you don't get rich staying at the same job or staying in the same job. You should promote, my perspective is against my opinion, you should promote within the organization to a higher paying position or move organizations every three to five years. Period, end of story. Um, and one of the reasons I say that 
is because most companies give 10 to 15 percent increases for promotion so if you promote from one job to another and are there scenarios where organizations will pay more sure uh, under certain circumstances but the next time next time you get promoted and you get an increase number one i want you to ask two questions number one ask your hr person what your increase is your total increase and then ask them how's that increase broken up how much of it is just the increase from the promotion how much of it is based on an upcoming merit increase how much of it is based on internal equity in the position and i guarantee you that you're going to have if your hr person is um detailed enough they're going to tell you look 10 percent is your promotional increase fit you know another five percent is an equity increase and then we're going to give you three percent because you're going to get a three percent annual increase because most organizations, and again, when I say organizations, I'm not I'm not talking small mom and pop shops, but larger companies uh, usually only give three to five percent annual increases. So when you when you think about it, when you think about an annual increase, three to five percent generally is not going to keep up with inflation, uh, because the the numbers for inflation are these broad numbers, but the fact is is the cost of cheese usually will go up more than than 3%. And that's 3 to 5% if they make money. So if the organization doesn't make money, then they're not going to give you increases in some cases. And so if you take the average out um, over time, you're going to see it's about 3 to 5%. So again, take that in the, into account when you're trying to build yourself to where it is that, that you need to be. And I have another video down where uh, where you could see that uh, talks about how to quit, how to how to leave your 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 job. So if you're if you're like me and, you know, I, I hate the breakup. It's necessary, but I hate the breakup. Uh, but sometimes you have to do it because at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself and your family. And another harsh reality is sometimes the people in your circle need to change. As I mentioned, I evaluate my friend groups once a year. I, what I do is towards the end of the year normally is I look at all the people in my circle and I say, are these people adding or are they taking away from my well-being and the quality of my life? Because the fact is, is there's nobody that just moderates. You're either adding to it or you're falling short because you're always moving forward. So if somebody stays in the same place and you're moving forward, guess what? They're taking away. And so you have to try to figure out how to strengthen that relationship. And sometimes you just have to let the relationship go. And every year, and and when I say let the, when I say I let the relationship go, I take the phone number out of my phone, I remove from my social media accounts, all of that, because what I don't want to do and what I cannot afford to do is allow there to be a drag in, in my life because of somebody else's need to try to dissuade me from what I'm doing or, or negativity or hostility or, or any of those types of things, because you just don't, life is too short and you don't have time for that. You just don't have time for those types of things. The next, the last thing on that one is, you know, never lose sight of your value. There's, there's, as, as you go through life, there's going to be people that assign a value to you. And what's interesting is when you look at incredibly successful people, incredibly successful people have constantly been told that they're doing too much. They're ambitious. They're overly this and overly that. But the person that's successful is the person that can overcome that and speaks to the fact and, 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 is, and is clear on and can articulate their value. I, I remember... I know many of you probably aren't, aren't golfers, but I remember there was an argue, uh, an interview with Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods, I think before one of his first tournaments, early on, there was an interview and the person asked him, what's your goal? And he says, my goal is to win. The guy says, well, isn't that a little bit aggressive because you're just starting out in your career? He says, well, and so Tiger says, well, why am I going to, play the game if I'm not playing the game to win. And the other guy, the interviewer says, well, you'll learn. Well, it's interesting because here we are almost 30 years later 
and 25 years later, and Tiger Woods is arguably the best golfer of all time. Um, and now, if you feel it's somebody else, let me know. If you disagree, I, I get it. Uh, some people don't like Tiger Woods, but Tiger Woods was a badass when he got on the when he got on the 18. So he uh, and and that's because he believed in himself. Uh, you take a look at uh, you know you look at any of these musicians. There are people that anybody that is a musician or an artist. I have a good friend who's a, who's a who's a, a, a well known artist, and he got dissuaded by everybody. Everybody kept telling him what he couldn't do, what he couldn't do, what he couldn't do. This guy's now teaching and you know, teaching art in university. He's writing books. He's doing um, it, he's doing all these things. Why? Because he's talented. He believed in himself, and he understood his value. And so, all I'm going to say to you on this, the last thing I'm going to say on this is just never lose sight of your value. I wish I would have realized that sooner than I did, and I understood my value with limits but I didn't have a full scope of my understanding of my value. And so I think it's critically important that you, that you understand your value. And then lastly, number nine is just be gentle on yourself. You know, even with the best plan and the great mindset, there's going to be bumps in the road. Um, when I was uh, in college, I, I had a teacher, a professor, his name was Randy Fugison. And he was my professor. He taught speech. And so one of the, the number one fear of people is public speaking. It's just one of those, the number one fear of people is public speaking. And we would go into his class and everybody was nervous. Why? Because people were afraid to speak in front of the class. And so he said one thing and it completely changed um, how I approached the class. He says, be gentle on yourself. And that was it. Be gentle on yourself. And I realized at that point, I didn't have to be perfect. I don't have to expect others to be perfect. I just want to do the best that I can do. And I ended up getting an A in the class. Uh, one of the few A's that I got in college, I, I might add. So it was, it was really impactful. And I, I, just, I just implore you, be gentle on yourself. So folks, I hope you found this video useful. And if you did find it useful or helpful in any way, Please um, don't hesitate to share with your friends. Uh, subscribe to the channel. I, I, I try to put up content every day just so you can to gain a different perspective. And I recognize some are going to be more useful than others for different individuals. But uh, right now, I think people are starting to uh, really pick what's, what's working for them and what's not. And if you have any comments or feedback about any of the content here, let me know. Uh, because again, I'm gentle on myself and I realize that I'm not perfect. And I, you know, it's the same as I expect from you. But on that note, I just ask that you have a good rest of your day. If you like the channel, like the channel. If not, then you don't. And I, I can live with that. But have a good rest of your day. Thank you.